So um, the next uh, part of this is a discussion about a project that was supported by Burroughs Welcome Fund. Uh, and uh, it, uh, well, I called it here, prioritizing quantitative concepts and skills results from analysis of suggested readings uh, from biomedical science faculty. The, the focus here was definitely on uh, biomedical graduate students. Um, and this was supported by Burroughs Welcome Fund through a quantitative and statistical thinking in the life sciences award. And I will say that um, this is a very much a uh, collaboration. The team members uh, include uh, uh, Vitaly Ganusov from microbiology here, Albrecht van Arnhem, who is the director of our genome science and technology program, uh, Tian Hong, who's in cell and molecular biology, Christopher Strickland, who's in the math department, David Talmy, uh, who's in microbiology, and Rachel McCord, who's also in uh, microbiology. And, um, and uh, uh, Sandra Larey is the uh, evaluator and also involved in this. The, um, uh, we have a draft of a paper associated with what I'm talking about. It's really in, in draft form. If anyone would like to, uh, to see it, I'm happy to share it, but it's not quite ready to distribute yet, okay? Um, so uh, first, a little bit about the major challenges of quantitative biology education. Uh, and in my perspective. First of all, there's too much to cover in any formalized manner. There's just a huge range of quantitative concepts and skills that are applicable across different areas of biology and uh, covering them in any formal way in courses is just not possible. So the question is, how do you prioritize? What should be expected conceptual foundations and skills for all of our graduate students? Uh, or for many of them, or for a few, how do you decide what, uh, what in some sense to cover uh, when and how to deliver it? Um, and this ties into questions about what's the effectiveness of different delivery mechanisms, whether they're formal courses, boot camps, lab group sessions, independent learning, and, and how do you effectively mix those? Um, and, uh, and so those are really the, the key questions that, that I see that uh, underlie the challenges of quantitative education, but they're not unique to quantitative education. These underlie all of curriculum development at every educational level, I think. Uh, and so what are the typical solutions to, to these challenges? So one is history, okay? You know, we've been doing this for years, so we're just gonna continue to do it. And, and a great example of that is calculus. And so I put up here a list of, uh, let's see, there's at least one, uh, one person attending this who has a, a book on that, uh, in, on that list. Um, and, and so calculus uh, has been the, uh, the sort of bread and butter of math departments um, across not just the US, but uh, the world for a long time. And math departments have figured out how to teach it and they're gonna continue to teach it. Um, and many, many of the uh, sort of life science programs at the undergraduate level require calculus. And as you'll see, that means that many of our entering graduate students have seen calculus, at least some level of calculus. But just because we've been doing it for years doesn't mean that we should continue to do it, um, at least at the same level um, that, that we have been. Um, so history is one way of, of deciding what should be in the curriculum. Uh, Another way is guidance from reports of experts. And, uh, and here I put experts in quotes uh, because they may be experts in some things uh, and, and not in others. And so I, I put up here um, several reports. Again, most of this is at the undergraduate level. So the uh, Bio 2010 report and um, the Vision and Change report from AAAS, the Data Science for Undergraduates report, uh, really focus on, on undergraduates. But the uh, report that's the HHMRI report on uh, scientific foundations for future physicians actually has a mixture. It is uh, foundations at both the um, undergraduate level in terms of uh, pre-med training programs, as well as uh, what are uh, appropriate uh, inclusions at the graduate level in, in training MDs. Um, so it's, it's one of the, uh, 
uh, one of the reports on that. And, and, and the interesting thing about that report is that at the undergraduate level, it really does emphasize quantitative things. At the graduate level, it does not. And that in part is, I think, arises from the fact that this, uh, it's focused on MD training, not on PhD training. Um, so uh, th there's, a, there's a, a bunch of reports on this and, uh, and uh, Jay Labov is going to give a talk a bit later who's been involved in many of these and many, many others uh, in terms of quantitative education and, and uh, education broadly speaking in science. Um, and uh, another uh, way to deal with these challenges is to look at guidance from accreditation agencies. Uh, on the engineering and computer science end of things, there's ABET, okay, which is a nonprofit that accredits uh, uh, programs. Uh, mainly we think of them in terms of engineering, but it's not limited to engineering. And there are other accreditation programs. There is not really a similar sort of accreditation at all in uh, in the life sciences, although a variety of professional societies provide guidance on what, what might be effective programs uh, at, uh, at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Uh, there's also accreditation agencies here. It's uh, in the southeastern U.S. at SACS, but everywhere across the U.S. there's actual formal accreditation requirements for our colleges and universities. And they uh, do have some constraints on what they suggest as appropriate. Um, but again, that's not generally down to the details of a, of a program level. So these challenges are not unique. Um, the, the challenges regarding delivery uh, options are also not unique. So uh, down at the bottom of this slide are the sort of range and uh, uh, a simplified way of the kinds of delivery mechanisms that might be appropriate from formal coursework through to independent learning and with uh, all, all kinds of things in between. And, uh, and I hope that we will talk about uh, each one of these and, uh, and sort of something about what we think of about effectiveness of them in quantitative education, uh, the relative cost and how feasible it is because some of these delivery options are constrained by who we have available at institutions. Um, and, uh, and not every uh, biology unit has close access to a uh, data science or a mathematics unit that has people who are actually interested in, in assisting in educating their graduate students, for example. So different institutions have different levels of feasibility associated with, uh, with uh, you know, solving this this range of delivery options. Um, another issue is uh, is how we might align with where the students are. Um, so I've looked, and there is no uniform data I've been able to find at all on what the quantitative background is of our entering life science graduate students. Uh, except that there are a wide variety of programs, and you'll hear about uh, at least a, a couple of those um, today, uh, that uh, enforce particular program entrance requirements in, in quantitative fields and in life science fields. Um, so, but there's no real uniform data across the large fraction of, of graduate programs in the life sciences about what the uh, expectations are uh, for for students coming in in terms of what they know or have exposure to on the quantitative end. Um, and I've regularly heard comments from people all over the world actually about concerns about, oh, our graduate students don't have basic knowledge of this or that. Um, so uh, to illustrate this, um, we actually carried out a pretty basic needs assessment for our PhD students in the programs here that, um, that we have in the life sciences and, um, and those are listed genome science, uh, biochemistry, cell molecular and, and, uh, and uh, ecology and micro. Um, and, and basically we did self-assessment of the students to say, what did you have before you entered your PhD? And I'm just gonna quickly go through these just to give you some idea. Um, so um, each one of these, we asked the students to say, did you have a formal calculus course? 
um, and the yes bars are in the orange and the no bars are in the blue and you can see on the calculus side a very large fraction of students across all of our graduate programs these are PhD students uh, came in with a calculus course many not quite as many but uh, almost as many came in with a formal statistics course but very few came in with a formal computer science course at all and then uh, at, at the more advanced level, we ask them, well, how many courses did you actually take beyond calculus? And you can see that uh, there is some uh, real variability across programs here in terms of how much uh, uh, sort of formal coursework in math beyond calculus, statistics beyond introductory statistics, and, uh, and, and computing beyond uh, the uh, any introductory uh, computer course um, and and the thing that sort of stands out from this is that um, in general uh, students have a, a bit more formal mathematics training than they have uh, formal statistics training and they have very little uh, computer science training at least for those coming into these programs but we also ask them well you know you could have had experience um, outside of formal coursework and so we said you know how comfortable do you feel uh, on statistics data analysis and graphing uh, and how comfortable are you in, in computer programming and in general they uh, they self-assess that they actually knew a lot more than what they were actually exposed to in formal coursework in both of these areas but a bit more on statistics than in, in computer programming so the, the kind of summary uh, from this is there's significant variation at both the within and between graduate program level and quantitative preparation. Uh, calculus and basic st statistics are much more likely for our students at least to be included in basic computer science. Math courses beyond calculus are much more likely to be included than more advanced statistics and computer courses. And uh, the students self-assess their experience in the use of statistics and computing higher than would be evident from the formal coursework. Presumably many of these students were in research experiences or working in people's labs and they got additional exposure there, particularly to uh, statistical methods. Uh, we actually have no data to determine how indicative these conclusions are for life science programs elsewhere. And I'd be really interested in knowing if any of you have done any kind of similar analysis of, of what your uh, entering uh, students are in your graduate life science program. So um, alternative to the approaches that I mentioned above in terms of how you prioritize concept and skill emphases, either based on history or based on accreditation standards or based on some set of reports, uh, there are uh, people that have done this in a variety of additional ways. So we found that there are indeed places in which the faculty have got together and basically as a group sat down and talked about, okay, we really need to enhance this aspect of our students' um, understanding uh, in our graduate program. How do we do that? Uh, and uh, there's been some, not many, but some that have focused on quantitative uh, things that we've been able to find um, uh, and have sort of published on that. Uh, but, but in general, the, there's not a lot. Um, so we wanted to come up with a, an approach that would provide some confidence that quantitative uh, training of students is aligned with the intentions of the faculty. And the faculty vary quite a bit at different institutions. Um, uh, also, we like to come up with a way that the faculty have given some careful thought regarding prioritization of a large array of possible topics uh, on quantitative ideas that could be incorporated. And we also wanted to ensure that training empowers the students to obtain additional expertise on their own external to formal and informal components of their training. So formal would be classwork, informal ones could be lab group meetings or uh, peer collaborations on projects, that sort of a thing. Um, so um, our approach for doing this um, has been to think about um, what, uh, a method to identify quantitative concepts that the faculty think are important but doing it in, rather than, than asking the faculty directly about quantitative ideas, we asked our biology faculty, again, this is biomedical uh, science faculty, mainly associated with our three programs in uh, biochemistry, uh, cell and molecular biology, and uh, the genome science and technology program, and the microbiology program. Um, 
So this was not about ecology. Uh, so we asked the biology faculty to each identify a single recently published journal article that they suggest all the students in their program should be able to read with comprehension, not because of the quantitative components of it, but because of the science. Okay. In other words, we asked for a paper that, by golly, they thought this was a great recent paper. And we emphasize recent here because um, the, the quantitative uh, components of publications have changed quite a bit over the years. And we wanted to be current on this. And we also asked them not to include review articles. Okay, So this would be a, a paper that, uh, that they really felt that all of the students in their particular program um, should be able to read with um, at least a reasonable level of comprehension. We then did an analysis of these articles for the quantitative concepts uh, and skills that underlie comprehension of the article. And uh, we assessed uh, the importance levels for each concept or skill in allowing a student to comprehend the paper. Uh, we then compared the distributions of importance levels across the variety of concepts and skills to identify which are most highly represented in the articles chosen by the faculty. And thus, indirectly, are those that might be most critical to emphasize in the curriculum. So this is a, a mechanism to utilize what the faculty think of as important science that the students should be able to comprehend to infer what the quantitative concepts are. And we realize that the, the methodology is not perfect because it involves um, a, our team uh, assessing the quantitative importance of different topics. So here was the process that we used. Um, we solicited articles from the faculty uh, that led to 48 articles across three programs. We did a first initial assessment of concepts and skills very quickly, um, independently, uh, not, not in groups, although we assigned each paper to, uh, to two different faculty to look at. That came up with a really long list uh, of 21 concepts and 173 skills. Um, and then we took those concepts and skills and we had a, uh, several meetings as a group and sort of condensed them um, to seven overall concepts and 68 associated skills spread across those seven concepts. We then, uh, for that limited list of concepts and skills, we did a paired review. So pairs of the team members, um, three reviewer pairs, uh, analyzed the uh, article content based on what we called four tiers of assessment, uh, meaning that this concept or skill is not in this article at all. Um, it is somewhat important to understanding the article. Um, uh, it is you know, a bit more important to understanding the article and is essential to understanding the article. So that's what we mean by four tiers of assessment. And then we um, analyze those. Uh, and uh, the objective here is to provide feedback to departments for curricular review. Um, given the COVID situation that has occurred, that is still a process that uh, is uh, kind of planned at this point because uh, COVID has taken over as, as you know, pretty much all of our lives in terms of just dealing with the day-to-day -day of uh, educational aspects of uh, both the undergraduate and the graduate curriculum. So the seven general concepts uh, that we came, uh, came up with here condensed uh, were graphics. Um, it says statistical computation, but it's actually statistical concepts. Um, there uh, on the left-hand side. Informatics, uh, statistical methods, computational methods, uh, and software and modeling. Um, and, and so what this graph shows is across that group of all the papers, um, the assessments of the faculty as to how important this particular concept is in uh, comprehending the key ideas in the article. As you can see, there's a pretty broad range here in that um, on the, uh, the the numbers there represent the percentage uh, that the faculty assessment of these papers um, led to as uh, the lighter colors are, it's not in the article at all, to the darker colors being very important to understanding the article. And, and so you can see for this group of articles selected by our faculty, uh, graphics, uh, uh, statistical, uh, you know, uh, statistical co concepts, statistical methods, and informatics uh, were uh, were considerably 
more important to understanding the article uh, than were modeling uh, or software to some extent. Um, but there's a, there's a pretty broad range. And within each one of these broad general concepts, there's a whole set of associated skills. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that uh, in the next set of slides, but I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. So um, I hope you won't, um, you'll take something away from this. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, what's A, the left-hand side here of this uh, general concept. So the general concept were graphics, uh, statistics, conceptual ideas, statistical methods, software, computational methods, informatics, and modeling. Um, and uh, the upper bar graph, um, uh, oh, and uh, the number of, uh, uh, of reviews here are 96. That's a 48 papers times two. Um, and uh, this upper pooled fraction is across all the papers, uh, how, how many of that um, pooled fraction was assessed as uh, level of importance is uh, one is low, four is high. So uh, across all of these concepts, um, you know, uh, this is the sort of fraction, uh, uh, not quite 50%, but a, but a, a bit less than that were viewed as, uh, as a very high importance across all. And then you can look and see that uh, what we've done is we've done a comparison of the distribution of graphics across all these papers to this distribution and done a relative difference between the graphics and this particular distribution across all of the pooled fraction, where the deviation is negative, meaning that graphics um, occurs less frequently uh, than across the pool or more frequently if it's, if it's red. So what this bar here indicates that, that graphics in particular is much, much more highly represented among these papers as, as, as assessed as being very important to understanding the papers than the overall assessment across all papers is across all the uh, uh, concepts. And it's highly significantly different. Uh, that's uh, indicated by, by these stars. Um, whereas uh, conceptual statistics was not really different. It, it mimics the broad distribution. Modeling is a, the other real outlier here in which uh, modeling is much, much less represented as important um, to understanding the, this set of papers than the broad collection of all the topics would be. So that's the way these heat maps are, are structured. Um, it's a little bit um, too much to, to sort of go through uh, all of them in detail, but I, I did put them all up here because I wanted you to see the list of concepts that were associated, for example, here with graphics. Um, these were the underlying skills that were included in graphics. They include the standard kind of bar chart, line plot, error bars, um, whisker plots, and, and so on that one might think of as occurring in many, many science papers. Um, and uh, in a similar way to what we did here, we can compare the relative importance of these different ideas uh, to um, uh, the um, general occurrence distribution of graphics in these papers. And again, you see that there are some like bar graphs are much, much more important to understanding papers um, than would be cumulative di di distributions or Venn diagrams or, or pie charts or log log plots down here. Um, and, uh, and similarly, um, for statistical concepts and, and, and methods, um, you can see the concepts and methods that we included in the conceptual end of things. So what's a probability distribution, what's hypothesis testing, what, whether there's Markov models or not. And you can again see that there are some of these that occur much more uh, readily than others across the broad pool of papers. This allows us to say that hypothesis testing, for example, should obviously be much more emphasized in uh, whatever educational initiatives are going on than potentially Markov models might be, for this group of papers at least. Uh, on the statistical methods, again, the values, the, um, the skills here are uh, uh, PCA, ANOVA, et cetera. 
Um, the uh, software end of things, there we had particular uh, gene alignment, uh, uh, genomic assembly, numerical equation, di differential equations, optimization. These are sort of the the, the group of software um, uh, methods that we had down, and on the computational methods, um, data filtering down through cluster analysis, Monte Carlo simulation, and Latin hypercube sampling as as just examples of of these. So. Um, um, on the informatics end, these are similar. And, and again, I'd be happy to go over this. It's, it's just to point out that we did a pretty careful analysis of a, of a method to allow us to assess how important to understanding these papers different skills are. So some take home methods from this are there's considerable disjunct between the typical quantitative preparation focus, uh, which is generally calculus of biomedical students and the concepts and skills that are identified from articles that faculty consider important. Calculus basically doesn't come up much at all in these papers. Um, uh, it's it, it really is feasible to use article analysis to prioritize concepts and skills that are identified as most critical. Um, and the papers that, that your faculty might identify are likely not the same as the ones our faculty would. Uh, and again, this is biomedical faculty. Um, there is considerable variability in how important quantitative concepts and skills are to comprehension of the identified articles. So that's the uh, that's the set of take home messages from this. I'm going to uh, end my uh, share screen. Okay, and uh, I've left uh, a little bit of time, not much, <laughs> for uh, for questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to look and see who has a hand raised. If anyone, I I see that. Uh, there's a set of uh, uh, comments in the chat as well. Um, and, and let's see. Oh, um, there's uh, Easton White says, yeah, there's some survey data for students at the University of Vermont. That'd be great. Uh, it, if, if you actually have access to that and can share it, I'd be really interested in, in seeing it, Easton. Um, let's see, Fred Adler has a hand up. Hey, Lou, that was a, a typically really interesting analysis. But my worry at the end of the game is you end up with an incredibly boring curriculum where you just plow through 68 skills. I don't think I even have 68 skills. And my <laughs> argument for calculus, even though people don't use it, is you learn something that underlies many of these things and allows students to build a concept map that unifies all these. Do you feel, I just, I guess I'm just worried about a just-in-time style education that's basically shallow. Um, I, I think that's a, a great question. And I, I really encourage you to bring that up in, in, in breakout sessions because there's no one solution to this. And, and certainly it was not our intention to say that these should be courses at all, that you know, they should be in, inculcated broadly across the curriculum. Uh, we're about out of time, but Jan, uh, DeFore has a has a hand up. So Jan, do you want to unmute and uh, and that, and comment? Yeah. So uh, so it was very interesting to see um, survey the literature, but I was wondering if it creates a little bit of a, a feedback where you know you're more likely to see bar charts in in a paper because people like micro or like uh, biologists are it it is a way that the, the something they're familiar with and that is easy to, to plot. Uh, but, but in many cases, you could find a better way to represent your data. Uh, you know, bar charts can yep. be misleading, misunderstood. Um, yep. I, just, I, just this idea of feedback is that you know, a lot of things that we're confronted with this history of like repeating the same patterns uh, yes. because that's the way we've done it. Uh, for I, I, it's, it's, exactly, it's exactly correct. And, and I, I certainly understand that. Um, it's one reason why we wanted to emphasize recent papers because our, our expectation was that there would be, you know, a, a more a, a different set of con, uh, conceptual ideas behind it. But that's you're right. That's a real limitation of the approach. 